Marijuana History 101. Or should I say extremely brief Marijuana History 101. It's big, complicated, and we'll only be able to scratch the surface. So let's get started. The first thing that strikes one as odd when looking at the history of marijuana, which is also known as cannabis, is how very much legal it once was. In fact, it wasn't only legal, it just happened to be one of the largest agricultural crops in the world, including the United States. You see, cannabis can also be hemp. And just what is hemp? Well, it's by and large the most robust, durable, natural soft fiber on the face of this planet. Up until 1883 and for thousands of years before, cannabis hemp was the largest agricultural crop in the world. It had thousands of uses and products. The majority of fabric, lighting oil, medicines, paper and fiber came from hemp. The first marijuana law to exist in the United States was a law ordering farmers to grow hemp. Benjamin Franklin used it to start one of America's first paper mills. The first two copies of the Declaration of Independence were written on cannabis hemp paper. Up until the 1800s, most of the textiles in the United States were made with hemp. 50% of medicine marketed in the last half of the 19th century was made from cannabis. Even Queen Victoria used the resin extracts from cannabis to alleviate her menstrual cramps. But the funny thing about industrial hemp was you couldn't get high from it. Yet, it was lumped in with the following, which also made little sense. Reefer Madness. In the early 20th century, yellow journalism had surfaced. Articles depicted blacks and Mexicans as frenzied beasts who would smoke marijuana, play devil's music, and heap disrespect and viciousness on the readership, a majority of which happened to be white. Some offenses included looking at a white woman twice, laughing at a white person, or even stepping on white men's shadows. And this ended up leading to a law in the form of a tax stamp. A tax stamp that would not only include marijuana, but also hemp and cannabis medicines. It's speculated that hemp's potential for an abundance of new products was going to be in direct competition with other sources. And this, added to the reefer madness, led to the eventual downfall of all forms of cannabis. Popular Mechanics magazine had actually prepared an article entitled New Billion Dollar Crop. Hemp was touted as being able to produce more than 5,000 textile products from its thread-like fiber and more than 25,000 products from its cellulose, ranging from dynamite to cellophane. Its superiority as a source for paper was also becoming known, especially with the development of hemp processing equipment. Now, the new Marijuana Tax Act was all fine and dandy, except for one thing. If you wanted to grow hemp, you needed to buy a stamp, but they weren't giving any out to anybody. And so, in effect, all forms of cannabis became illegal. Things pretty much stayed that way until World War II, when the government decided that hemp once again was a good thing and produced a video, Hemp for Victory. But by the time the war was over, hemp again became bad. And in 1948, when the marijuana law once again came into question, Congress recognized that marijuana was made illegal for the wrong reason. It didn't make people violent at all. It made them pacifists. The communists would use it to weaken America's will to fight. Congress now voted to keep marijuana illegal for the exact opposite reason they had outlawed it in the first place. And all through the years, report after report, commissioned by everybody, from the mayor of New York to the president of the United States, has come back with the view that marijuana should have no criminal penalty attached to it. Yet. Marijuana remains as illegal today as it did nearly 70 years ago. Marijuana. It's become big business. A multi-billion dollar business, both in Canada and the United States. But why has it become such a big business? 
Here in British Columbia alone, it's speculated that the illegal BC marijuana trade brings in upwards of $7 billion annually. And up to 85% of that product heads south to the United States. Having become an international issue, when do the lines blur? How does a massive underground market like this survive while remaining illegal? Why is marijuana illegal in the first place? And if prohibition is meant to protect us, I guess the most obvious question is, does the prohibition work? If prohibition worked, okay, if you could just wave a magic wand and say, this has gone away, I'd be all over it, you know? But the fact of the matter is that prohibition has never worked. You know, we've been here before. You remember the first prohibition, right? Which was? Prohibition of alcohol. No, no, I'm talking about the first prohibition. Thou shalt not partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And who was the big cop? And how many people did he have to watch? Two. What are the goals of this prohibition? I assume the goals of prohibition are to reduce the amount of drugs available and to reduce the demand for those drugs. Uh, in both instances, uh, cannabis prohibition is an utter failure. Has the prohibition stopped people from using marijuana? You get a phone call and says, I'm from the federal government. I want to know whether you've been using cocaine or marijuana recently. <laughs> Presumably, you might be getting a little bit of an underestimate. In 1937, there were estimated to be 55,000 marijuana users. And now there are estimated to be more than 50 million of them. Uh, that's a 100,000% increase. Seems to be quite a few of them. Yes, I'm afraid there are. Whether the drug is, is criminalized or decriminalized does not affect um, the rates of smoking of cannabis, either uptake or of discontinuation. So what are the dangers of using marijuana? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Gives you like a rapid um, heartbeat. Smoker's cough. I'm sure it has some effect on your uh, brain function, memory. I don't know, is there something unhealthy about moving slowly? It's not good for you. You're not fully conscientious of what you're doing. Thicken some membranes in your brain or something. Well, it's been science. I guess it's, I get. I'm, I'm being told it's been scientifically proven that marijuana kills your your brain cells. Ah, uh, that's the one I remember. Marijuana kills brain cells. I thought the same thing. You know, I didn't start smoking pot until about five years ago. I thought pot made you stupid. You know, I bought into it just as much as anybody did. I realized when I was like 30 years old that I was tricked. I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. 1974, the Heath Tulin study. Ronald Reagan announces, the most reliable scientific sources say permanent brain damage is one of the inevitable results of the use of marijuana. Monkeys pumped full of marijuana, apparently 30 joints a day, had begun to atrophy and die after 90 days. Brain damage was determined after counting the dead brain cells of both monkeys who had been subjected to the marijuana and ones who had not. This study became the foundation of the government and other special interest groups claim that marijuana kills brain cells. Here's what they didn't tell you. After six years of requests, how the study was conducted was finally revealed. Instead of administering 30 joints a day for one year, Dr. Heath used a method of pumping 63 Colombian strength joints through a gas mask within five minutes over three months. They suffocated the monkeys. What they did is they put these gas masks basically on their face and they pumped pot into it, but without additional oxygen. So after X amount of time, the brain shut down. Well, if you suffocate, the first thing that's going to happen is your brain cells are going to die with lack of oxygen. So what they did is they suffocated the monkey, showed all these dead brain cells, and then, if, uh, then went on to associate it by saying that cannabis use causes your brain cells to die. And how many people, not knowing the origin of the study, have gone on to call it and record it? And now people believe it. Studies since have shown no signs of any brain cell damage. In 2005, new research suggested that marijuana could possibly stimulate brain cell growth. That study hasn't received the same attention. Another common belief, marijuana causes lung cancer. In the 1999 study by the Institute of Medicine that was paid for by the United States government, they had to use words like may and uh, should cause cancer. We've been hearing for years them trying to say that it causes lung cancer and we say really that's interesting because you can't even show us one case of cancer being caused by cannabis use alone. You definitely have to do it moderately because it does paralyze the cilia but if it's not radioactive you're probably not going to get cancer from it. Smoking it 
can be harmful because of, of the, the proper use of smoke. Not as a result of anything in the cannabis plant, but because they're intaking heated plant matter into their lungs. People said, well, you don't know, we haven't been smoking it long enough. Look what uh, happened with cigarettes. We've had about four decades, or more than four decades of experience. If this was going to show up, it should have shown up by now. Finally, a study came out just in the last month verifying that cannabis smoke does not cause cancer. It's different than nicotine. And the elements in the tobacco smoke do cause cancer, and the elements in the marijuana don't. There's no cases of marijuana-only smokers getting brown lung syndrome. There's no cases of marijuana-only smokers getting emphysema. Strange for a plant that's so dangerous. How come none of that? Marijuana is as bad for you or worse than tobacco? Impossible. If they had the evidence, they'd be putting emaciated bodies or emphysema, lung cancer, black lungs. They would be parading them throughout the media. They don't have one. Yet people somehow rather think that it might cause the same thing. In fact, if you look at the straight deaths from substances, a different type of picture starts to appear. The number one killer in the country? It beat out AIDS, heroin, crack, cocaine, alcohol, car accidents, fire, and murder combined. Tobacco. That's a nasty, dirty thing to say, son. A lovely, pure white cigarette causing cancer. It gets me right here. <laughs> With an average of 430,000 deaths per year, considering it's a number one killer, it's interesting to know that tobacco receives government subsidies and is grown with radioactive fertilizer. Cigarettes. Number two on the list? If we don't include poor diet and physical inactivity, with well over 85,000 deaths a year, alcohol. As we look much further down the list, there are others that may surprise you. Caffeine comes in with one to 10,000 deaths a year. And some of our most popular pain relievers, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin, still make an appearance with over 7,500 deaths annually. Where does marijuana lie in this? What kind of staggering number do we find? I don't know. 50,000? 250,000? 300,000? From marijuana, I'd probably say then 80,000. I would say it would be hundreds of billions. Get ready for it. Here it comes. There are no deaths from cannabis use anywhere. You can't find one. In 10,000 years of known use of marijuana, there's never been a single death attributed to marijuana. There's 400,000 deaths in America alone every year that are directly attributed to tobacco. I've heard that you have to smoke something like 15,000 joints in 20 minutes to get a toxic amount of Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. I challenge anybody to do that. And even in the animal studies where people have loaded the animals up with doses that would be hundreds of times what a human could possibly be exposed to, I know the animals don't die. The LD50 seems to be astronomical. I mean, you can die from ingesting too much aspirin. You can die from ingesting too much coffee. The drug warriors who say we have to protect society, save these people, are being just a little bit disingenuous. Not one university or medical facility has ever recorded a single death directly attributed to marijuana. But never mind that. There's other problems, other reasons to fear it. Take addiction, for example. There are more kids in addiction clinics for marijuana than any other substance. This must mean that marijuana is the most addictive substance today. It's undoubtedly true that there are more uh, teenagers and kids in treatment for marijuana than all the other drugs combined. What the DEA never tells you is why that's true. A kid is caught possessing or smoking marijuana. He's taken to court. He's given a choice. Either you, you know, some horrible penalty, or you go to a treatment center. Obviously chooses to go to treatment, and goes to treatment there, he's considered an addict. 